On balance, I think we're in a better place than we were in 1971 when I first um, became familiar with this field. Um, I think local institutional review boards understand their roles better than they did at that time. They were quite new in the early 70s. And data monitoring committees um, play a very important role in many multi-center studies. Um, I think members of data monitoring committees have become more sophisticated in dealing with complex uh, risk-benefit questions, and um, biostatisticians play an important role in helping data monitoring committees with their work. I think there's still a great deal that needs to be done. Um, somehow, institutional review, review boards need to be given greater honor and visibility and even dignity, I think, in colleges and universities um, and in companies that do research. Um, it shouldn't be uh, an assignment that's given to the junior faculty members. Uh, it ought to be the, the best and most experienced clinicians who serve on institutional review boards. I think having an interdisciplinary group is essential for multiple pers perspectives. I think having public representatives on IRBs is also important. Where I think we are still falling short is that we don't have a central registry of all clinical trials that are being currently conducted. I think that's very important for people to have, to know what's being done both in the private sector and with public funding. And I also think that all studies, the results of all clinical trials should be publicly disclosed, regardless of whether the trial turns out to be, quote, negative. That is, it doesn't prove what the sponsor intended to prove. It's only if we have all the data that a meta-analysis of all the studies on a particular topic make uh, a meta-analysis makes sense. Uh, if we only have the results of studies that turned out in a way that's positive for the intervention, then we get a one-sided picture. So uh, I, I, I think there should be a time limit, perhaps a year, after the closing, the conclusion of every clinical study, that the data will be publicly disclosed and then made available to those who, who perform analyses uh, of uh, the results of a certain intervention. Just as there are ways to redact information in classified documents, I think there are ways to protect uh, human subjects in research studies. Uh, any identifiers of, of age or gender or certainly names uh, could, could be removed. Um, I, in, in essence, what I'm saying is that I think that the general public and scholars should have access to the kind of information that the Food and Drug Administration currently has. I think that this, this hiding of the data uh, on grounds that it's proprietary business information uh, is, is not a tenable argument. The reporting of serious adverse events in any clinical trial is a, is a core moral obligation of the researchers. So if they don't do it, they're really falling short of, of, their, of doing their duties as researchers. Um, we in the general public depend on their doing so. Um, in, the, in the field of human gene transfer research, um, NIH was surprised and disappointed to find after the death of Jesse Gelsinger when they looked at research involving adenoviral vectors, 
that only between 5 and 6 percent of the serious adverse events in studies with those vectors had been reported in a timely way to NIH. And it was clearly in the guidelines that they, those events were to be reported. So um, it's part of the social contract of researchers, I think, with all of us, that they're going to let us know when a serious adverse event occurs. Sometimes it's hard to disentangle what's, part, what's a result of the underlying condition in a sick patient. With healthy volunteers, there's generally not a question of where a serious adverse event uh, originates. <laughs>